Today's guest is Sam Simon, the founder of both Atlas Oil Company, a company he built from nothing to over a billion in revenue, and Simon Group Holdings, a diversified holding company that has grown to include 120 companies with a focus on investing in operationally experienced entrepreneurs. Now, during the episode, Sam will discuss the importance of having core company values and how that shapes the direction of his business and why he'd rather accept slower growth than make a bad hire. We'll also discuss why his management leads from the field, which enables them to capitalize on opportunities by having a direct, real-time understanding of the market, customer needs, and evolving industry trends. Now, without further ado, my interview with Sam Simon. When you got started out, if I was looking at your company history correctly, you started with one truck. So yes. what were some of the operational lessons you learned along the way of taking it from one truck to dealing with the biggest companies out there and pipelines and all that? Yeah. So the biggest thing that I did when I first started Atlas Oil, I really wanted to buy the best truck that I can find. Everybody was telling me about, don't get hit by a Mac. <laughs> so I went up on a Mac, made it like beautiful truck with all blue and then orange stripes on it. I wanted to set up a company that everybody's going to be looking at it, that this has been established for a long time. I want to do everything right from the beginning. So every single, I had uniforms on. It says Atlas on it. Nobody knew that I just started the business. In the oil industry, they needed service. So the service was like Monday through Friday. They don't work Saturdays. They don't work Sundays, eight to five. And then the other part, I always wanted to buy my own business. So I convinced my dad, let me do it through my credit card. So I had a credit card, a card $30,000 with a credit card. And what I did from the morning, I went and then really sold the products. During the night, I went and delivered the products. So I had an overall coat on, so my tie on, and I delivered the fuel. And then really, they needed service, and they wanted somebody who is willing and able to deliver the fuel on time. So I'm a big believer on time, just like the Amazon, on time, all the time. Was that just something that other existing suppliers were not doing? Yes, they were not doing. They were more of a uh, laid back. Um, in the eight to five kind of mentality. So I took it a whole new levels. I'm a big believer in the best people I can find. So I hired the, my first driver. And again, I wanted to make sure he or she had a passion. This guy had a passion of driving, love driving, good personality, loves people. He drove in the mornings and then I used to sell in the mornings. When he gets tired at 6, 7 p.m., I used to take kids on from till 2 a.m. And really the other part that I got to tell you success is you got to work hard. I slept probably five years in the office to make sure that I can handle all my customers' needs. Yeah, that level of dedication and getting employees that are excited to work hard and really deliver that level of service, that's not standard for the industry. Yes. How have you continued to be able to attract people like that to Atlas Oil and all the other companies you invest in? Yeah, it's never easy, but the biggest thing you got to start first is with culture. You got to have a good culture so people willing and able to come in and work with a great environment. I'm a big believer in one of our core values is passion. I love people who has passion. I don't care if you're a truck driver, you're a biller, you're a tax person, you're a salesperson. We take our time and interview the right people that wants to fit in. And that's what they like to enjoy. So we take our time to make sure we hire the right people from the beginning. But we got to make sure that the team has the tools. We always love to give people the tools, the training, making sure what they're going to get into. So I'm a big believer. It's all start with people. If you have a good people, you have a good culture, you can continue to grow. And is the most important part of culture having a good team already in place and not lowering the standard. What are some yeah. of the things that make a good culture for you? Yeah, for good cultures, open communications, setting the right goals, clarity on the goals and continue to communicate with the team. And then really be flexible with the team too. You got to just make sure that the team understands where we're heading, having a weekly reports, it's helping people, really creating a family oriented. So people need to be part of the family. And as you're growing company, how can you keep it a family when it's so large? It's larger than any family I know of at this point. I start with every new employee comes in. I still do the culture training. So it's not as easy. Today we have over 700 employees, but you got to have a culture. So I'll be more than happy to share with you our six core values. So one is passion. You can come to work and then it's not just about work. It's about this is what you enjoy every day. So 
people sometimes when they're coming to work, oh my God, I got to work to doing this. But you know, when people coming in, if their passion is, that's what they love, they don't look at his work. So you can tell their smile, they're happy, they participate, they look at things. Second is pride and image. Mainly your quality of your work, your quality of your presentation, you prepared in the meetings, you're ready. Everybody has what I call their brand. I have a brand, you have a brand, company has a brand. So that's your brand. When you're late, when you're not prepared, when you're mumbling, this is not a pride image. The third is solution driven. So we're a big believer. There's always going to be issues, always going to be problems. Every company coming up with a solution, and I'm a big believer, it's team, team concept collaboration with people. And we have a lot of whiteboard. How do we solve the issues? Because you don't solve issues in any companies. Again, it's like an arteries of people getting heart attack, like people getting heart attack. They don't clean their arteries because the company is the same thing. This is what you see companies goes bankrupt, gets out of business because they never handle these issues. They don't know how to handle issues. The fourth is collaboration and innovation. So you got to collaborate with the team. There's a lot of good people out there that your teammates and this is how you get best ideas, best innovation. So all of our innovations came in from our team members, but you got to have the collaboration. You got to encourage the collaborations. You got to get involved with them. So these are kind of things we do when we do our cultural trainings, we give examples and ideas. The fifth thing is customer focus. So we all have to make sure that we're connecting together. We're working together and then we can help each other. Then we can help the customers. I'm a big believer, always follow through customers, always have time for people. Even if you're busy in the meeting, just send an email. This can then get back to you two hours, but not doing anything. That's not a service. Then the last one that's really dear to my heart is do the right thing. If you see something that's not right, something's not kosher, something doesn't smell well, call it out. This is what you have a lot of issues with companies because they're all looking at their shares, their, their dollars and things. Sometimes dollars is not what you got to do. It's you got to make sure something is wrong. You got to call it out and you got to take the blame or you got to do something about it. So do the right thing. So for me, this is how you build a team. This is how you build people wanting to stay with you for a long time. This is how you have good people, part of the family. So you got to start with that culture. So that's how you earn, we can say, how you keep these people and how you bring in more people on. Yeah, that makes sense. But along the way, I'm hearing things that are not, it doesn't sound like you take the cheap way out. And I know some would view oil and some of the other commodities you mentioned as things where customers would often be price focused. For example, Seraph works with a lot of manufacturers who yes. may be making a part that 10 other manufacturers could have quoted for. So how can you afford to do things right when you probably do have customers that are looking at the price compared to cheaper options? Yeah, that's a good point. So the biggest thing is if you start with the core values and when you see something doesn't make sense, and I'm a big believer that you got to add value to the customers. So if customers has to see a value. If there's a value for that customers, then they're willing to pay. If you don't show value to these customers, they can go somewhere else. So our job is to make sure our service, our quality. And if we do something wrong, we should say, hey, we made a mistake. It's okay. That's part of our culture. And sometimes we have to pay for our mistake. And we're not here for a short term. We're here more of a longer term. And then I'm a big believer. We pick up customers from reference. People just say, hey, this is the company you need to deal with. Apple's oil is that service, best quality. Their people are really fantastic. And they're willing to go out of their way and helping out. Service, it's a key. People doesn't want to stay on the phone for an hour trying to get something done. They don't want to wait in line by getting something that's It's all about the service and quality. So it's not an easy, it sounds. That's when we have to make sure that every single detail that we do, it, we're thinking of the customers, not about us only. We're still talking about culture. Along the way, as you've grown, you have acquired a few companies. I'm not exactly sure how many, but what were some of the lessons you learned from trying to integrate other businesses into your existing holdings? Yeah, the number one thing that we always look for is when we go to any business, we look at the people first. You can tell people are happy. You can tell people are miserably. People wasn't dealt right. Usually it's the culture issue. And then when you buy a company, the first number one thing that happens to anybody, they're already having an issue. What are we going to do with them? So the first thing you got to do with each individually of them you have to have one-on-one -on -one and make sure that you make them feel very comfortable to telling us 
what can we help them? It's the other way around. What can we do? Where do you want to go? How clear do we're going to go with this business? Where we're heading? And we will know the people that doesn't want to be here. And I'm a big believer. If people doesn't want to be here, we need to get them out as soon as possible because they're going to cause a lot of issues. And the people wants to be there. Let's give them all the tools and let's make sure that they have everything what they need. But all starts with people first, not about the balance sheet, not about the cash flows, not about where we're heading from a growth strategy. Let's make sure that these people are happy. And we want to make sure that they're clear about where our goals are and where we're headed. Yeah, that makes sense. And as the goals are clear, you've built this business through multiple economic downturns. Keeping a culture is probably easier when everything is going good and growth is coming quick. But have you learned anything from navigating through financial crash or recessions and things like that? Yeah. And the number one thing, I really believe every single person wants to do the right thing. I really believe if you're communicating with the people quickly and telling them our crisis, telling them where our issues are and getting them in the table with you, instead of sending a memos or things like that, but you get people engaged, people involved and tell them we have an issue. What can we do? Usually the right people will help you navigate what's going on and how we get there. We all have to suffer a little bit here and there. We all have to give back a little bit. Some people says, hey, Sam, instead of working five days, I can work three days, but I want to keep my job. Hey, somebody says, you know what? I have a little bit more money. I want that person to work a little bit more than me. But I think it's bringing the team together and being honest to them and being frank with them. Tell them, here's our issue. How do we solve it? Instead of from the top sending a message, we're all about from the bottom to the top. So it's exactly the opposite. So we want to hear everybody else telling us how we should be looking at it. And then majority of the time, people want to do the right thing. Yeah. Now, from studying both Atlas branching out into other types of fuels, as well as investing, I noticed that you have a knack for spotting new opportunities and then taking action to Take advantage of them. What are some of the things beyond people that you're looking for when it's time to branch out into a new product line or it's the right time to invest in a new technology? So the first thing that we look for is it exactly what their needs are. I mean, if there's a need for a company, either A, is there a capital need? Is there having issues with clarities, having issue with the plan, with the strategies. The first thing that, that I do is I assess the people first when we go in. Then you can see the facility. If it's clean, the background is clean, people are happy. You can tell by people want to do the right things. So I go to businesses. I don't look at the balance sheet. I don't look at the cash flow. First of all, I go and look at the building, look at the facilities, look everywhere on. And I'll tell you, I can tell either they're going to be successfully or they're not besides before I can even see a balance sheet, before I can see a cash flow. Because you can tell either they're clean, their facility is ready. You can see when you're walking down just the warehouses, you can see people are happy. And the other part, when we talk about businesses, it's really understanding what exactly the market there can, uh, end up, can help you grow the business. So there's so much growth strategy, but these people either they got hammered in not enough capital, they don't have the right tools, they don't have the right equipment. So my job is to really opening up to the team to say, hey, what do we need to grow the business? What are we missing? What tools do we need? It's as much as simple as that, but believe me, a lot of big corporations, it's all about the budget. It's all about dollars, it's all about cents. They forget about the people and strategy and then the people makes the business worse. On some of these new technologies, like when you start embracing other types of fuel, what motivated that change? Was that something that your existing customers were asking for? You saw that opportunity. How do you decide when to say, let's keep investing in what we're currently doing, or we need to actually people and money to doing something? New? So I'm all about the front line. I call the front line. Front line is the drivers, the tech people, the maintenance all the front line who's doing the day to day. So the front line knows exactly what customers are having issues, problems, or what they need to get done, what they're missing. And then you have a session with them. They come back to you. So I'll give you one example. We build a fast fuel automation in the system there. And then the fuel automation, it came in from an engineer who was in the field and says, look, these people, they have to shut down the frack business every day when they get the fuel. 
we need to build something that they don't have to shut down. It costs millions of dollars and they need information, but there's pumps and everything else. So this guy says, look, Sam, I have an idea. Here's how we can solve these issues. So everybody says, Sam, be careful. Don't go to this guy because he's going to be asking you for some money, some ideas. No, I want to listen to him. So we go to the whiteboard. He drawing exactly. He just needed 350 grand from me to come up with this concept. It's a 50, 50 chance. But again, giving the two holes, giving the opportunity to this guy, I gave him $350,000. Today, that business is, it is doing over $30 million of EBITDA. Just to give you an example, by just giving a chance to that, and today we're solving tons of efficiencies to the customers from our technology. We have 25 patents we created out of that part. And we invested about 30 million now into this business. But just to give you an example, you get to the front line, you got to ask these questions. And my question is always, what do you need? What tools are you, you're missing? What is our customers looking for? And asking that questions. I mean, it seems simple, but this is what I think people don't want to ask. And I think... The simplicity, how do you actually do that? Is that just from you setting aside time in your schedule to make those visits? Have you formalized a process or is that just intuitively how you act? Yeah, so I'm about the front line. You got to go and not at the office. I'm not an office and I really believe every single leadership should be on the road. Seeing customers, seeing operations, seeing facilities. We got to turn this thing around. Your meeting should be in the field. Your meeting should be with the team. Your meeting should not be just sitting in the desk in the office and then plenty of opportunities or issues or areas that you need to fix. It's all in the field. So I go to the field. That's how I get my best ideas. That's why I get my best information. It's from the front line. If you start with there, everything else you can handle. Yeah. I know you've been an entrepreneur your entire career, so you probably can't speak exactly to how other companies do it or why they have meetings in their office, but as you've built a culture where people have these meetings in the field, how do you manage what other companies typically do in their office? Are you doing conference calls or is it just your company structured in a way where the decision-making is decentralized, where it's out in the field where those decisions get made? Yeah, there's going to be times you need to do the office stuff and things like that. I really believe the paperwork accounting, the paper day-to-day -day accounting, even accounting, if you want to have a good accounting controller, don't you think a good controller should be in the field, understanding how these people having issues sending paperwork in, how they look at the customers, how they see everything else. When you come back, you're organizing your team behind the scene to make sure that there are certain things we could do it easier and better for the field and the field can do it easier or better for the county. So as much as I can tell your office, it's once in a while you have to do it for a different reason. But I think the majority of 80%, I call 80% of people don't do a good job of getting in the field. The field is the most important thing if you have operation. The other part, you'd be surprised how many customers can give you either you're doing good, you're not doing well, how we should be looking at things. The best ideas that comes in from there, from the success side of it, that's how we made a lot of our money, is by getting on the road and seeing customers. I used to cook, I used to go and cook spaghetti with some of the construction companies because this is how you get all these people from the dispatch. Also, they will tell you what the issues are from the competitive side of it, from a standpoint, from our side of it. This is how I got better. Yeah. And now switching a bit to talk about your role as an investor and supporter of other people people's businesses. Can you just describe a little bit? I know you gave an overview at the beginning of how Simon Group Holdings works and the different types of businesses you invest in. It sounded like sometimes you, I think a term I've heard before is incubate where you're actually starting the business and sometimes you're investing in businesses that need capital. But if you could just sum up a bit about how you invest. Yeah. I'm always a big believer of somebody's idea. Somebody has an idea. If we're a startup, somebody's coming in wants to start up, it's like a shark tank, like anything else. You look at that person first and their passion comes out. They did their homework. They have a good, solid process of going how to go after getting the new business and opportunities. Truly what they're missing is capital and they're missing some advice and strategies and some things behind the scene. And then if these people have a drive, I'm a big believer of hunger and the drive behind it. I'm willing and able to give people chances because somebody gave me that chance. So I look at it that way. And then I really want to 
take my time to make sure that they're solid in their business plans and things like that. And what tools do I have to get them to help them out succeed? So again, I call it connecting the dots. Where's my connecting of the dots? It's all about relationships and people, all stuff. If I can help him connecting that dots that he doesn't have, again, there's another tool that I can give him. So that's part of my investments when I look at the people. The other part of it, if we're investing in a company already existing side of it, all I got to make sure what do they need from me? So if there's nothing I can help, I'm just an investor. There's really nothing I can do. So I'm always looking at somebody that needs our tools, our passion, our strategy, and then helping them out with growth strategy from a capital, from backroom, from a strategy. Then we can figure how do we can grow that business? And then I believe one plus one equals 11. How do we add additional than just one plus one equals two? Yeah, I love that. I'm definitely going to steal that line. And so what are some of the core skills? Atlas was very operationally intensive. You've talked about culture, being on the front line. What are some of the other things that you can bring to a business you're investing in? Mainly clarity and focus. There's a book by the name of Jim Collins from Good to Great book. The other one, Gina Wickman just created tools. It's the tools concept. There's a tools that you use. Mainly what the tools is, understanding you work on it through a quarter by quarter. It's setting a goal, setting a strategy, focusing on no shiny stuff. So there's a process you go through the process. If you learn it from a young age, and then you learn bringing some nice coaching with you. And these people help me have that clarity because sometimes a good entrepreneurs are all over the directions. They're just running so hard, but they forget you still have to have a process. You still have to have good tools behind you and make sure there's a measurement. There's a good KPIs. There's a good systems that you know, you're heading in the right direction. So that's the tools that we bring into the team to help them out because you know, I wish I had the tools when I first began, I was running exactly like them, all the mistakes that I made. So today we're helping these entrepreneurs, hopefully having the right tools so they don't miss the opportunities that they need to do or clarity. They're not going after shiny things. That was not their plan. Keeping them focused because you know, you're energized, you're hungry, you have a passion. Sometimes shiny stuff can get in the way. Yeah. With passion, you can definitely get excited. Easily. It, happens. it happens. So we bring in the tools. That's what we bring into the table. We bring in all the experience that we have and we've been operating. So I was an entrepreneur. I took risk. So it's not just, I'm just a private equity. So I have more than just private equity. I have all this operation, the background that I can bring to the table. Yeah. So I had made a lot of mistakes. I made a lot of mistakes. So hopefully I can help them show yeah. them. And if they listen, it's great, but sometimes not everybody listens. My job is to have them focus as much as I can and to help them out with connections with the strategy and make sure that they know if they need anything, I can help them. Yeah. I find that I personally, I sometimes listen, forget, make the mistake again, and then remember, and then I've learned the lesson. Speaking of that, what are some of the biggest lessons you've learned from your career? Has there been anyone that's really helped you shape your approach to business and leadership? Yeah. Don't compromise hiring the right people. When I say the right people, not the most talented people, not the most PhDs. Make sure that the job needs certain people. Make sure you stick to your game. This is what we need from that person. You have to have the right DNA for different reasons. And I'm telling you, when you rush it, when you're trying to just plug in a person in there, majority of the time we made a mistake. So that's where we can't comment. Sometimes you're going to have to say the growth have to slow down. We can't just bring in these people in because they're going to cause a lot of issues. So I'd rather say, hey. I'm here for the long run, not for a short run. It's important to get to that. Second side of it, COVID happens, 911 happens, shit happens, and you got to make sure you have enough good balance sheets, a good cash when you can get it. Don't spend it all. Don't go so much in debt. I always say to people, cash is king. Make sure that, that if you're not clear on your vision, on your strategies, then you got to make sure you have a good survey from your team and what I call 360. Make sure everybody's aligned that they all understand exactly. When they're not aligned, you'd be surprised so many people go in different directions. And we believe that sometimes we think they're heading in the right direction, but you find out that they're not. So let's make sure, double check, triple check, whatever you need to do, make sure everybody's aligned with the clear goal. Yeah. Having the right person in the right seat, the first one that you mentioned, 
Is that about really making sure that you have a good job description and you stick to it? Does the problem go that you're sometimes putting people who have different career aspirations in the wrong role? What are some of the mistakes that you actually experienced to learn that lesson? I think you said it well. First of all, make sure the job description is clear. In the second, the goals is really very clear too. So the goals and the clarity is also. The other parts that I see sometimes is training. Make sure you train these people because you don't want to rush it. Because sometimes they're just trying to put people, they need a seat to fill. They just bring them in. And the problem is we're the fault, not the person. We didn't give that person a chance from a training, give them the right tools, make sure they understand our culturally well, Make sure that they understand the job well. If you have the wrong people in the seat, think about what happens. So many mistakes happen. Our customers not going to be happy. Our team members are making mistakes. All that stuff because we didn't do our job. So again, it all starts with that right person in the right seat. And then make sure your job descriptions have to be clear. Because sometimes you bring in more talent. That job doesn't need that talent. It needs communications. It needs spending time with people face-to-face. -face. So it depends on everything else. And again, the majority of the companies rush us because they just need to fill a seat. I wish it was like a, get a magic wand. Here's a magic wand. You can fill it. And that's when we learn a lesson. This is the number one thing you got to do. And then sometimes you have to slow the business down. I hate to say it because you don't want to just have a seat filled just because we have to. Yeah, it's interesting. We're recording now in 2023. I know a lot of manufacturing businesses service businesses are really having a hard time attracting people and they're doing a lot of different strategies to try to bring people in. Also at the same time, a lot of tech companies over the last year, they had hired a bunch of people and did massive layoffs because either they had tried to hire too fast or they may maybe realized they had hired the wrong people and their culture wasn't maintained. So that's yeah. definitely a challenge a lot of people are thinking about. So now is one of the times where talent has been harder to get in the last year. Are there any specific things you're doing besides being patient to try to bring uh -huh. people into your company? Yeah, so what we're trying to do is we're trying to bring in people we can train to develop, to take the next seats. I'm a big believer it's you got to bring in people from either colleges, you got to bring people that wants to develop to a career, bring them in, teach them about the business. They might not fit in this job, but they can get trained, they can get the understanding of it, they want to be there. So you got to try all kinds of stuff. We usually do a good job on the reference, who they know, family members, who they know from friends and people wants that. What happened to COVID, everybody wants to stay home, everybody wants to do the things from the house and we need people inside the office working there. And then the other part, you got to be flexible in some cases. You might say, hey, I'm willing to have these people stay at the home because the job doesn't need to be at the office. So you're going to have to have your team to be flexible. Then we got to be in the part of our HR, we got the head of HR. He says, Sam, these guys not adopting to us. I says, no, we got to go adopt to them. So we might have to change to adopt to them. We're going to have to be flexible ourselves too. So this is not an easy, but you got to keep changing. You got to keep looking at it different ways. Since you hire some people straight out of college or at early on in their career and provide a training program, what advice do you give to young people you meet when they're starting out in their career about taking opportunities and making the most of them? What advice would you give? So the first thing I always tell the people, where do you want to go? Where do you want to be in five years, three, five years? Not just how much money you want to make now. You got to think about your career. Where do you want to be when you grow up? You want to be an entrepreneur? You want to be a, a supervisor? Then we need to make sure we develop you to get there. Because when you get to that, point that we need to teach people differently. We should be making sure that they have flexibility of not doing just their job, working with someone else that can mentor them to get their career what they want. It's about the careers, not about how much money can I make today. Sometimes they don't have much patience, you probably know. They just want to go, go, go. And you just got to sit with them and make sure you work with them. And then how you got to be a good mentor to them. You got to give them advice. You got to give them work. I mean, it takes a lot of work, but First, the most important thing, where do they want to go? I had a person says, I want to be an entrepreneur. I said, okay, are you willing to take risks? Are you willing to work hard? Are you willing to do certain things? He says, yes. I said, okay, then let's work through that process. Well, I think that's a good place to leave it. I definitely learned a lot. I really liked your six points for culture. I'm definitely going to be reviewing that afterwards. So thank you so much, Sam, for, for joining us. I appreciate us. it. Well, good luck. Appreciate it. Have a good one. I'm glad Sam was able to join me today. In Seraph's work with manufacturers, we found it to be essential to solve challenges on the shop floor. 
And it was great to hear Sam emphasize the importance of leaders being on the front line in operational businesses. Manufacturing Excellence is produced by Serif Consulting. To learn more about us, you can visit us at serif.com or on LinkedIn at Serif Consulting. Serif is a specialized global strategy and operations consulting firm that partners with business leaders to handle their most complex supply chain operations and manufacturing challenges. Leaders from across the globe come to us to solve their immediate problems and capture their biggest opportunities. We deliver long-term operational improvements by working with leadership teams, plant floor to the boardroom, enabling our clients to transform their entire manufacturing operation. If you learned something from this conversation and want to make sure that you're able to hear future episodes down the pipeline, make sure to subscribe to this wherever you listen to podcasts. Thank you for listening, and I hope to see you on a future episode.